Hello everyone. I am not watching the live stream, so I don't know exactly what you all are seeing. It would help me a great deal to have the host let me know when to actually hit the go button. But I am Professor Ness, and this is Sky Dragon Story, which is sort of my personal five-year project that I started back in 2013, finished in air quotes, middle of last year. Shut up, don't make me do math, do math on stream. But host, are you ready to go? I am ready to go, Prophness, and super, super excited for this run. This is going to be a good one. All right, so time going to start, assuming I have everything set up correctly and my joypad responds in three, two, one, go. Now, um, you'll notice a couple things right off. Um, first, we have a timer in the corner. That's because we are in speedrun mode. And second, we have pretty much no other dialogue whatsoever. And that's because we are in speedrun extreme mode, which basically cuts the interface down to only the times and places where the player actually has to make a decision. Um, that, along with the category any percent jokeless, is basically intended to show the game without completely showing the game, since this is a very new game, and I would rather folks who are interested actually look at it and play it themselves without getting spoiled on the plot. Um, so the category any percent jokeless in particular refers to this game has several endings, around about uh, half a dozen, depending on how you count, and we are going for the earliest plot ending, which is about 75% of the way through the game. There is one ending that I believe you can get to sooner, but it is, it is very much a joke ending and it would involve going after a few secrets, and since this is pretty much the game's public debut, I'm not going to be showing too many secrets. So, the game itself, as you can probably recognize, it, it started life as, or it started conceptually as a NES Little Mermaid clone. Um, I discovered NES Little Mermaid back in high school, Low-key fell in love with it, and also noticed that no other game ever in the history of games actually reused that mechanic, so I kind of wanted to. Started a couple times over the years in oh, Applet Java, in raw C++ OpenGL, making Mern game-like engines, but uh, those projects kind of sort of died off. It was more work maintaining the engine than making the game, and I also didn't have a great concept for the game beyond, hey, mechanically Little Mermaid. Um, but round about 2013, I... it was actually a dream that I had playing Little Mermaid, but when I left the water it became more like NES Kirby's Adventure. And that struck me as a cool concept. Like, what if, and not necessarily Kirby's Adventure, but what if, say, a Metroidvania platformer where you actually had to unlock the ability to platform because you started off as a mermaid and even out of the water was kind of difficult. So, the first few areas of the game are going to be all underwater, and since we have no real powers right now, the first area is block and switch. Yeah, very simple block one, switch one. Very simple block one, switch one, block two, switch two. Block one, off of switch one. Cross switch two, off of switch two. Actually, across switch three, off of switch three. Block two, off of switch two, across gate. Block one, switch three. Block two, switch one. Block one, switch four, easy every time. 
that, that's kind of sort of the pattern you might notice is, yes, every, every area of the game has a theme, has a gimmick, but once I know that you understand the gimmick, I'm not going to make you do the exact same thing over and over and over again. So, first area, very short, easy puzzle, medium puzzle, hard puzzle. Actually, not necessarily hard puzzle, but active puzzle. There's actually a cute story behind the interaction between this clam and this button here, but I found in practice it takes longer, much longer to tell than it takes to complete the room, so we're just going to complete the room and make sure we don't get crushed, make sure we get this first quick cycle. And just like that, less than five minutes in, we are already to the first treasure room with the first treasure, the goddess bracelets, gauntlets, arm thingies, everything in this game has a proper name, proper lore, proper background. I have been using the proper names for the last 10 years. I am well and truly over myself. I'm going to be calling things whatever flows off the tongue most quickly. By the way, shout out to Blue Glass. The intended route out of that room is up top in the Blue Glass room. Blue Glass was one of my earliest playtesters who not only let me watch him play the game, which was immensely valuable, but he also gave me some good verbal feedback after the fact. And triangulating between those two, I determined that yes, I needed a tutorial area that you could not just grab and carry blocks, but also throw them. Um, but we are backtracking out through the way we came in to grab a blue droplet, which extends our blue bar, and also to die. Now, in this game, there is no returning to the title, which made for some interesting debugging as I was preparing the speedrun. There is only death is a place you go when you die, and it's dark, and it's scary, and you have to kind of figure out where you are and what you're doing. But once you die one time, you get a quick exit. So in the sort of coin flip that we end up dying later in the run, now that we have taken the death warp when it took about as much time as exit in the area normally. If we happen to die again later on, it will be a much faster restart. So, dungeon one, treasure one, of course we have boss, boss one. Um, gonna use a quick kill on boss, dating back from the very first implementation of the collision system, when it didn't really matter whether projectiles or potential projectiles hit the enemy or vice versa. So we're just gonna stack the two free blocks run the boss into the free blocks, which cuts off two cycles. We're going to cheese out the remaining two cycles by hiding in the hole without going as far as leaving the room, which you can do. And so it'll be a real quick clean boss, boss fight, hopefully. Now, later in the game, there are areas where you need to grab and stack blocks and climb on them and there are enemies wandering around, and in those areas it was kinda awkward to have enemies running into your block pile and self-destructing themselves underneath you and taking the block pile down with them and you had to reload the room. So I needed to fix that behavior. But fixing that behavior made me lose my quick kill on the first boss, and I didn't want to lose my quick kill on the first boss. So, long story short, there is actually a flag in the collision system turned on only for that first boss fight that rolls the collision mechanics back to the early pre-alpha mechanics. So, you're welcome speedrunners, you can actually quick kill that boss, even though you won't be able to do the same things with blocks anywhere else in the game. So now we are already to the second catacombs. I'm going to have to have a little bit of concentration time for one of two actual RNG, like proper pulling the RNG points in the run. This CS100 knockout wall maze, where the only constant is that the exit will always be at the furthest point from the start, and it looks like we got one of the longer possible layouts. There we go, for one more blue droplet. And I'm also going to be doing some weird motion to avoid these ghosts. Now, these ghosts have a story. They actually also come from NES Little Mermaid. You probably haven't seen them there, but I promise they are there. I found them. Again, I discovered NES Little Mermaid in high school 
when I also discovered hex editors and ROM hacking, and I had a hunch from observation of the first room of NES Little Mermaid what the level data probably looked like. Turns out that I was close enough to correct, but for entirely the wrong reasons, but I did end up finding the level data, and I ended up doing some early pre-editor level hacking. Um, and after the room layout data, I stumbled across the object data, like the enemies and shells and power-ups and all that good stuff. Um, it was easy enough to figure out the format of the object data, and, and it was really only four values. It was the X and Y position, the room ID, and what type of object it was. And the most interesting thing to do with that was to you know, figure out what all objects were in the game. So I just took the first object in the game, incremented the object ID, incremented, 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 and found like all of the various types of objects that were present in the first stage of the game. And then I found some objects that were just really totally glitchy looking and pretty much gave up, except on closer examination, those objects behaved like objects from elsewhere in the game. Now you've probably seen this if you've seen like Mega Man ROM hacks, Mario ROM hacks, anywhere that a hacker can put stuff into a level that was not originally in that level, it's probably not going to be loaded in the tile set, but it will otherwise work just fine. So there were a handful of objects like that. Now, running past the end of the objects that were in the game but maybe not native to the level, I found objects whose behavior was obviously intentional, but I didn't recognize at all. Like that they would be you know, floating around, making diamond triangle motion patterns. Some of them would damage you on collision, some of them wouldn't. Most of them would just stay and bob in place. But of those sort of unidentified objects, the vast majority had as their graphic the player sprite. The player sprite all assembled and animating, animating in some combination of reactive to what the player was doing and reactive to what the mystery object was doing. And it was creepy as heck. So of course I knew that then when I needed creepy as heck ghosts enemies for Sky Dragon, I, I just had to give a shout out back to the creepy data ghosts in NES Little Mermaid. So we now have the second treasure, so we now have the ability to grab and carry stuff, and the ability to go snake form, snake dragon form, and run and jump and climb out of the water. I'm going to be making hey a... Prof, I, uh, I've got some good news for you, if now's All a good right. time. Yeah, I'm a little bit ahead on my talk track, so go ahead. Perfect. Well, I just want to let everyone know that we have met the incentive for Pet the Kitties. So after uh, the base run is over, we are going to have some kitty petting action, and I'm pretty excited about yes, that. Yes, we, we are! are at, we are at $376 now, so thank you to everyone who's donated so far. And we've definitely got some uh, fun bid wars and incentives to donate to even still, so keep an eye on those, and hopefully I will be able to talk about them uh, a little bit later in the run. All right. Now you'll notice I collapsed a little bit early there, earlier there before getting back into the water. You are a mermaid. That means your ability to walk on land is actually tied to your blue bar. So if you do too much carrying, too much dashing when you're out of the water, you will actually collapse until you have recovered your stamina a little bit. But back to the plot, this is our first occasion meeting our self-selected nemesis who killed off a pig, did something to us, it doesn't really appear to have affected us, and she flew off. We don't really know what that was about, so we're going to continue into the forest to try and find the forest shrine, forest shrine keeper, let folks know what is going on in the outside world, see if we can find the third treasure, dodging these spooters real carefully. And now we have, 
Of course, since we can grab and carry things and we can run and jump, we have the obligatory block stacking area. It's not even a full dungeon, it's just a chunk of map. And just like the first dungeon graduated you from, hey, yes, you can put a block on a switch to now solve proper puzzles, the block stacking area goes very quickly from, yes, congratulations, you can put one block on top of another, to sort of kind of what I would have expected any self-respecting, exploratory game player. Come on, you big coconut. What I would have expected any self-respecting, exploratory Metroidvania player to do, and that is carry the big block thing around to the far corners of the map until we can find somewhere that maybe we can either clip out of bounds or climb out of bounds or go somewhere that, yes, you can technically get to, but was maybe not the area you were expected to go to right away. Joke's on you, this is the area you're expected to go to right away. Now there is plot here. Um, the monkey chief is kind of put out that his village was just wrecked, and while he has the third treasure in his possession, he is not willing to give it to you, and he's not even willing to trade it to you until you have something to trade. I need to remember to tag this save point because there is a slim but non-zero chance of death in here. So, but there is no need to actually talk to the monkey chief. We can just go straight into the third catacombs. These are the math catacombs. Everything is all exposed state, you can tell exactly what the numbers are, you can tell exactly what every button, every switch does. The overall objective is to balance water levels across four towers, but if all you do is, if, if you explore the area and write down everything, you can solve this dungeon in one go on a three inch sticky pad. Um, if you just run around and push buttons until something happens, you're going to be here a while. It's intentionally a very sprawling dungeon. I'm going to take a quick detour in this room, knock out these anemones, and grab the teardrop up top. Oof. This stupidity of jumping into the shotgun bullets is the reason that it's possible to die in here. Now, Talking point, of the things that I am most proud of in this game, the first is of course releasing it to begin with after 10 years, the second is absolutely the plot, but we're not going to see much of the plot, the third is the fact that I very intentionally wrote it mechanically and technologically in the style of a classic 8 or early 16-bit console game. So. There are no real physics, like you couldn't do on an NES, okay, acceleration times delta time into velocity times delta time into position and have it all be nice, precise, technical term is floating point fractional values. You only had 8-bit integers 0 to 55, so a lot of physics back in that era was Real quality physics. R E E L K W A L I T Y F I Z Z I K S T M, possibly all one word. And that generally meant tables. He was like, why compute a parabola when you can just have a table of vertical positions in a parabola and in index into that table based on the number of frames that the player had been holding the jump button? The table might only need to be 12 or 16 bytes long, and that is already as much as four 32-bit floating points to try to do proper math. So it is. And it is also like two or three CPU instructions to look up and add a table value versus several dozen instructions, particularly if you're having to do 16 or 32-bit math in software on an 8-bit processor to do real math. So one of the fallouts of that, and again similar systems on classic, particularly 8-bit games, is there are no subpixels. Subpixels are a myth. Um, 
seriously that it might it might be that yes under the hood like you you might see cases where you move two pixels one frame three pixels the next frame two pixels three pixels etc etc but that generally under the hood just means that a table has two pixels three pixels two pixels three pixels not that you are ever on pixel 2.5 of a screen that is in any way mechanically sliced with finer finer granularity than the whole pixel so having taken the cheeky developer math route which to not spoil it too badly relies upon the fact that again 8-bit style math division by two is more of a bit shift that drops off the low bit that means all divisions round down so abusing cheeky developer math route um, we are now through the math puzzle and we have flushed the seed we couldn't carry the seed the seed was too big to carry which is why we had to do the math puzzle to begin with but we have flushed the seed back out the drain pipe to the root system of the old sky tree and there's not much more we can do with it so we're going to go up and talk to the monkey chief finally and see if we can convince him to accept the seed and the possibility of a new sky tree in exchange for the third treasure. Now, unfortunately, the monkey chief was always a little bit butthurt at being fast talked around, so he has gone up into the treetops to sulk, and he's also gotten large. And anytime you have a large monkey in the top left corner of a constructed arena, there might possibly be game mechanics that happen. So, gonna have a little bit of serious time here, just because if this fight goes south, it goes south in increments slowly over the course of the fight, and that means that by the time I die and have to restart, it is several minutes into the fight, and that's not good for anyone. So, going to almost got the double there. Since I didn't get the double on the first two cycles and it's speeding up, I'm probably not going to get the double hit. So just normal semi-fast strats. The casual strats, oof, that was, oh, okay, we did get that one. The casual strats are to bait the rolling fruits up that middle ramp so that they come to a pretty much a stop up at the top there. Once again, I may remind you, Real quality physics, these things look like they are doing physical interactions. It is all completely faked mechanics that look like physics without really being physics. Slopes are hard, as anyone who has programmed slopes can attest. Yeah. Easy strats, just wait at the top of that middle ramp and wrestle the spike fruits up the top ramp, but since wrestling them up the top ramp takes time, and time is slow. This is probably the most practiced strat of my entire practice, was making sure that we could do this fight in only one or two attempts. And as such, we may be, just on this fight alone, 20 minutes faster than my submission run. I'm gonna use these red herring platforms for their only real useful purpose, to have the life up early. And it turns out the boss did not have the third treasure after all. He probably dropped it somewhere during the fight, which means it fell down, which means it landed in the drink. And of course, anything that lands in the drink is probably going to get caught in the U-Bend. So we have to go down to the bottom of the U-Bend. And sure enough, there it is, the goddess belt. And what the belt does is you, pro you probably noticed that previously our kick attack was seriously nerfed, now it's back to full strength. We also have a much taller, floatier, again, not strictly physics, you can make the jump table anything you want it to be, jump. We also have a little bit of a secret air dash. It's not a very useful air dash, but it is just enough to detour and pick up another couple power-ups. And now we can go back and talk to the tree spirit. 
Tree Spirit tells us we've done all the right things. We have soaked the sky seed in shrine water. We've brought it back to where we want it to grow. And if we, he's going to give it his blessing. And if we come back in 100 years, we'll have a nice tall new sky tree that we can climb. Now, I think I would be thrown out of the marathon if I did the 100 year route. So we're going to take a shortcut. We're going to expose the seed to some goddess power from the treasures. Cut 100 years off the run. Make sure I hydrate while this is playing out. And yeah, instant new tree. And just like that, the monkeys were as fast as we were, so as soon as we exit back out to Monkey Village, we have a nice tall new sky tree that we can start climbing immediately. I guess it's some relative of either bamboo or whatever wood they make the um, African rain sticks out of all the spikes inside that make such a nice sound when you pour beans through them. So straight up the sky tree and oh hey it's our friend, our nemesis, our frenemy. Now I would not suggest just mashing through dialogue boxes if you're playing this casually because TLDR, how you treat people matters, it determines how they treat you, it determines how you are able to treat them in the future. Okay, we did get that jump. That saves us probably frames. The real time-saving jump is going to be here if we can get the wind direction exactly right. Now, the wind is not one of the random elements of the game. It is more typically 8-bit console game randomizer that is generally, unless you're doing something real serious, some combination of game time, room time, player input type, player input time, um, XORs, bit shifts, prime numbers, all thrown in the blender to get something that is chaotic enough that it's you're not really going to be able to influence, that, influence it outside a task, but still nowhere near enough entropy to be a proper random number generator. So while well, I can sort of wiggle around and try and make the wind do something different from what it's doing in the moment, you can't really control exactly what the wind is doing. But we are already at the fourth shrine, gotta remember to grab this droplet and talk to the old man and secret developer tech just like that. We have skipped the fourth catacombs and have the fourth treasure. Or am I bluffing? One way or another, we do have the fourth treasure. That means that with all the blue droplets we've collected, we now have multi-jump that is pretty much unlimited. We also have a air dash that burns through a lot of power, but is faster actually than ground motion. We go in full on sky dragon mode here. And we can fly on over to the sky shrine to talk to the high priestess, to figure out how to talk to the goddess, and ultimately how to confront the big bad. Turns out though that the High Priestess is not in right now, so we are greeted by the Acolyte who invites us in and let's pull up a chair, we can talk things over. Except now we've just gotten caught by the security system. Why is the Goddess's hero getting caught by the security system in the Goddess's Shrine? Why is having collected all the goddesses' treasures not making you, like, immune from suspicion? Um, plot. Lore. Spoilers! So, not gonna get into that. Instead, we're gonna get into the area I affectionately refer to as the Meat Grinder. There is not really anything in here that you can damage. There is a lot of stuff that can damage you, so I'm gonna be taking it a little careful here tiny bit of serious time to make sure I nail the developer route here that is one damage boost, not two damage boosts, not three damage boosts, and try to get that heart. Um, and one of the sort of development philosophies here was that if you're playing casually and you have a little bit of life to spare, this shouldn't be all that difficult a game. I have tested every jump, every obstacle, every boss pattern, there is no forced damage, but if by contrast you want to do a low percent run, that is on you. That is all the guarantee that I am giving you. So I myself cannot play the game fully low percent. So 
it's nice to be able to take a hit in here every now and again. But doing pretty well, if I do say so. A little bit of air jump there, just to make sure I don't hit the spikes, and that is the last of the technical platforming in this run. I'm going to jump in, tag the save point, because another small serious time. This is this room is a boss. It is the boss room. It is called the boss room. I hope that's not too complicated for anyone. Um, the objective is to break all of these sensor switches. I just need to not get flustered. The drop pattern is very much rateable. Um, challenge chat to see if they can pick out exactly what the drop pattern is, but oof, that, okay. Yeah, that's why I need to just pay attention and not get flustered. Um, but once you break all of the drop shoot sensors, the drop shoots do not know to stop dropping blocks just because the stacks are full, and that means they jam up, and when all of the drop shoots jam up, the boss has nothing left to do but self-destruct. So the objective is going to be to break all the sensors and then stack a full stack of blocks on one end of the room or the other while we still have time to do so. Okay, now we are home free. We just need to camp out here until everything fills up. Good time to hydrate again. And then get out of dodge real quick because you do not want to get caught in that collapsing block pile. So that is the last technically difficult part of the run as such. Just climb back up the last little bit here, and remember to grab the final droplet of the run, and... Hey, it's the High Priestess! Oh, you're the High Priestess! Okay, plot, 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 spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. Among other things, she also wants to be the Goddess's hero, and so she is going to take the treasures for herself and tell us to go, go down where all good pet mermaids belong, just hang out in the creepy bone pile pool back at the bottom of the Sky Shrine. Now, we don't really want to do that. We're going to try to escape, but we are now merm. We are now normal vanilla merm with normal vanilla merm powers, which means it is slow and kind of painful to try to crawl all the way back out of the dungeon. We have a lot of time to reflect upon how we got here, what we even thought we were doing here trying to be a hero, what exactly we accomplished by killing all those people earlier, and TLDR, this is where the game gets properly dark, and there is a thing that you are nominally expected to do here but I knew before I released the game to the public, there needed to be a way to not do the thing that you might do here. So we are going to not do the thing that you can do here, and instead we are going to have faith that even though things are bad, even though what's making them bad doesn't really feel like it's within our control, maybe, maybe if we just wait it out, there is a chance that things will get better. So now is a great time for self-care. Stretch, hydrate, say something good about yourself, say something good about the person next to you. You, you out there listening, you are amazing. Keep it up. It is also the time in the run for the host to take over and say anything and everything that the host has to say. Wonderful. Well, I have a lot to say. I mean, I'm happy bear. I always have a lot to say, but... Uh, I, what I want to talk about right now is we just opened three new donation incentives. So two for Gauntlet 4, which is our first run tomorrow on Monday, and another one for Ultima First Age of Darkness a little later on tomorrow. So the Gauntlet 4 ones are Become a Viking, and who doesn't want to become a Viking? And we only need $200 for that. There's also Punch Death to Death, which 
Sounds incredible to me. Who wouldn't want to do that? That's also $200. And then for Ultima, we have the Kill Lord British Stand-In donation incentive for $100. Now, uh, we also have a couple of bid wars going right now. And the Morath's Dungeons one is to choose which class the runner will use. Sage, Mage, and Wizard are all at zero dollars, so we have some anti-magic people in chat right now. Cleric is at nine dollars, and Pilgrim is at one hundred dollars. So we definitely have some Pilgrim fans, but if you're interested in any of the other classes, definitely donate for that. And we also have a Gauntlet for Bed War for the naming incentive. We have some pretty wild names here. With twenty dollars, we have Burgers with an exclamation point, Bob Runs, Jauntlet, He Rub Me, and My Boy Bubba, all of them with zero dollars. So that is definitely a ripe for a little donation intervention there. Prof, do we have a little bit more time or is now a good time uh, yeah, to um, turn it back to you? Should, should have a few more minutes. If you're out of things to say, I can always comment on game or take audience questions, but if you have other stuff to say, go right ahead. Oh no, no, I am never out of things to say. Everyone, I just want to remind you who we are donating for. We are donating for Take This. They are a mental health nonprofit and their main mission is to inform the gaming community about mental health issues, provide education on different disorders and prevention techniques, and reduce the overall stigma around mental illness. As someone who struggles with a couple of mental challenges myself, I am passionate about Take This's mission, and I hope that you will all donate so that we can reach our $10,000 goal by the end of the week. Their motto is support community and mental wellness because it takes both appropriate support including healthy work and home environments, clinical support, and opportunities for self-care, as well as a supportive community to build the resilience everyone needs for mental well-being. And let's face it, in today's world, we all need that resilience. So I really encourage you to donate and to check out some of the resources that Take This has available. If you want to know more about them, please visit Take This. Org. We also have a Twitch stream every Monday at 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. Pacific on their Twitch. You can see them playing games featuring clinical and sometimes ridiculous commentary from Dr. Kelly Dunlap and Dr. B, Take This Talks Dev with Eve Gravache, Take This Talks Community with Rachel Cowart or Dr. Sarah Hayes, and sometimes even a mental health AMA. You can see the full description on Take This as Community Resources website. Just type exclamation point resources in chat. Now, okay, perfect timing. There we go. Perfect. That yeah. is excellent timing. So Wonderful. We did. We we held out. We did pass out from exposure, but we were rescued. We were taken back to the Mermaid Village, but everything is now dark and eerie and creepy. And we are still not the hero. We are still generic mermaid. We still kind of feel like we have let everyone down and we're basically just a failure and we only really want to be alone right now. So we're going to go back out to the monument in the bay and just try to be alone. But it turns out we fail at being alone, so we are immediately found by the acolyte from the Sky Shrine who gives us back the circlet and tells us to go see his pops up in the mountain shrine. Pops will know what to do. Gee, thanks, we are a mermaid. We, like, we're a mermaid, you're asking us to climb a mountain. We're a mermaid, you're asking us to, without any powers other than multi-jump, go back through the creepy forest and past all the spiders. Well, fortunately, we don't need to go to those lengths because if you have been exploring the normal requisite amount in an exploration Metroidvania type game, you have probably 
figured out that there are no bottomless pits, there is only down, and where you can go down, if you have the power to go up, you can also go up. So we are going to go straight up, cut around the forest, go straight up the side of the mountain. Don't even have to do the wind puzzle again. Yes, I have made sure that even if you are doing a low percent run, you can still take the outside of the mountain route. You will have just enough blue bar to do that. And back to the mountain shrine, back to the old man. Old man takes the circlet, but remember how we skipped the fourth catacombs? Well, turns out the fourth catacombs are less a place, more a state of mind. So we're going to go into the state of mind that is the fourth catacombs, and we're going to reflect. We're going to reflect on all the shiny crystalline walls. We're going to reflect on our own reflection. Say hello to our reflection. Hello, reflection. Going to be asked some questions, going to give some answers. Once again, I would not suggest just mashing through these dialogues. They do control the ending that you have available to you. Fortunately for us, just mashing through the first option every time guarantees that we get the short ending to the game. If you are familiar with Suikoden 2, this is sort of the cabin in the woods ending where we decide that we don't like we don't like what trying to be the hero puts us through and we just we just want to not be the hero anymore so that's going to have some ramifications but it does mean that we can end the game early i would say it is about 25 percent of the way from the end of the game so 75 percent of the way through the game also do not adjust your twitch it is really getting a little darker a little lighter depending on our path through here that's not the restream but in another room or two, time will be coming up. It will be as soon as we talk to the goddess. So one more prompt. One more room and time in three, two, one. Holy heck, a 36! 37, 46, 23 was my previous personal best here. So this was this was like maybe even half my submission time for this game. So my apologies to the organizers. This is going to be quite ahead of schedule. In compensation, the credits are a little bit longer than they were on my submission run. So small apologies for that. You know, I don't think anyone wants to see you apologize. I think everyone is excited for a world record in this run and for game go fast. So, Eugene, congratulations, Prof. That is awesome. You can't see the heart hands that I'm making right now, but... So, since we met Pet the Kittens, I can load up that diary. There were a number of interesting bugs that I found during testing playing this speedrun-wise with things that did not get reset properly when you tried to go straight from one run into another run without a save file and without completely reloading the page. I think most of those are fixed, but... Um, so hopefully I can just grab my designated Pet the Kittens Diary, paste it in here, and move right on ahead to Pet the Kittens. What is Pet the Kittens? Hello, controller, inputs, there we go, okay. Yeah, so, since beating the game was the only way to get back to the title, I did not find a lot of the reset bugs until it was possible to re beat the game, but it looks like we are clear, so petting all the kittens. This is a late game, or really end game, ultimate challenge. Turns out that when you meet the ultimate arbiter of the universe, who challenges you to the ultimate challenge, 
and you ask the ultimate arbiter of the universe why the ultimate challenge always needs to be a battle to the death for ultimate power. Why can't it be something that you know, it benefits all parties involved, like petting kittens or eating ice cream? The ultimate arbiter of the universe will absolutely make you a personal ultimate challenge involving petting all the kittens for unlimited ice cream. So, doth thou desire the kittens? I want them! I want the kittens! So be it. What, me? Shout out other games? Never. So yeah, this is basically an obstacle course. You have all of your powers. Why not put them to good use? Petting kittens. So, 10 out of 10 kittens hidden in random corners of this arena. There is intentionally no good and perfect and elegant route through here. You just have to figure out one for yourself that involves the minimum number of cul-de-sacs. So, this is just the route that I tend to take because it's the first one that I got comfortable with. Still, there is a way you can hit this swinging log that just sends it flying because, again, real quality physics. I stopped being able to get it as soon as I started actually trying for it, so go figure. But at least we now have infinite bar so we can do unlimited dash. Nine kittens, just one more kitten. Go away, block. All the kittens, yay! But wait, there's more! Yes, we have our very own Mount Midoriyama floof tower full of awkwardly placed spikes and increasingly obnoxiously fast treadmills that will throw you into them as soon as you land, but we get to glomp the floof! Glomp, 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 and 126. That is not a great time, but it's not a bad time. So let's see. How good a time was it? Well, of all the adventurers who have ever challenged this course, drum roll. Eh, who does these things competitively anyway? Who, I ask you, plays video games competitively for time? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know anyone. Do you? You get your ice cream either way. And yes, no matter how much ice cream you eat, there is always more ice cream left. So, yes, this has been Sky Dragon Story. Thank you all for watching. I am sure, I am sure the Valks can find other people who do actually play video games for time. But if you want to try out this game, it is absolutely free online. It is also open source creative commons. I knew I was never going to protect this enough to make money on it anyway. If I am permitted to post a link in chat, I have a link I can post in chat, but otherwise, feel free to cut me off and move on with the marathon. Well, sounds good, Prof. Well, uh, looks like the mods are asking for it to be dropped in the okay. Valkyrie's Discord. And so if you want to put it there, and uh, yeah, congratulations on the world record and on this great game. I had such a good time watching this, and it ended with a bunny. Yep. Where's Char Bunny when you need her? Um, so it ended with a off. giant bunny. So just imagine, imagine how floofy a bunny is when the bunny is like 16 foot tall. I am getting sent into transports of delight just thinking about it. So thank you, Prof. And uh, yeah, we are excited to talk about the next run and uh, uh, just to tell you a little bit more about our donation incentives that we have right now. Well, friends, if you have wandered in here from a food coma or sleepwalking, or just clicked on and you're wondering where you are, well, you are with the RPG Valkyries, and this is our speedrun at Marathon, speedrun Ragnarok,